Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Hello, today I am excited and honored to have Rabbi Daniel Cohen on the show. Rabbi is a motivator, mentor, and inspirational speaker. His unique blend of authenticity, humor, wisdom, and insight helps anyone better navigate contemporary society and lead a life of legacy. Rabbi Cohen is author of What Will They Say About You When You Are Gone? Creating a Life of Legacy and is co-host with Reverend Greg Dole of the National nationally syndicated radio show, The Rabbi and the Reverend. For more information, and he'll tell us about this at the interview, you can visit him at rabbidanielcohen.com. Welcome to the program, Rabbi. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have you here. And so let's just, let's just jump right in. Um, I know you've written a book about the importance of each one of us asking ourselves, you know, what kind of legacy do I want to lead? And I um, have heard you talk about when your mom passed and that sort of was the instigator for you to really look in your soul about this kind of question. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I would say that, um, you know, when my mom passed away, um, I wasn't necessarily at this moment certainly asking those questions. She was right. She died from a brain aneurysm. Within a matter of 48 hours, my life was great. And then it turned upside down. I was a college student. And I would say that in that moment, I certainly appreciated even more deeply that life can change in an instant. We think that everything is exactly going to be the same. As unfortunately, as we've seen in the past number of months, uh, there's no such thing as certainty in life. Right. And every day is a gift. And I went through certainly a long period of mourning for her. But then when I got to the same age as my mother, and I always knew that she was young, I asked myself, when I got to 44, am I doing the most that I can with the life that God has given me to truly yes. leave this world a better place and maximize every moment? And that, for me, was one of the catalysts for not only personally thinking about what it means to lead a life of legacy and impact, but rather, how can I help others do that as well? Because we certainly don't want to wait for a moment of crisis to get serious about life. And this is the other, I would say, motivation for me. As a rabbi, I come in contact with many people. And sometimes I won't hear from people until there's a call that says, Rabbi, I'm in the hospital. Or somebody right. said that, pray for me. And that's when they get serious. And then I don't hear from them afterwards. And it's not because, God forbid, they died. But rather, it's because everything's fine. And they go back to life as usual. But life is exactly. not meant to be a highlight film. So the premise of the book is you're at a funeral, and as you walk out of the funeral, I think we all have this moment where we say to ourselves, what will they say about me? And then for about 15 minutes, we're motivated, and we say, I need to spend more time with my family. I need to think about what's truly important. And then we go back to life as usual. So the concept behind the book is I help people identify what is your best self? What is the kind of life you want to lead? And then I take you on a journey of seven principles to reverse engineer our lives. So we leave the lives now for how we want to be remembered. Interesting. Wow. That's so fascinating and so important. Well, I just wanted to read this small part of the article you wrote um, about your mom. And you said, although the pain of my mother's absence will never disappear, I've realized that she is ever present in our way lives in ways I never thought possible. Though she's not with me physically, I sense her presence, hear her voice, and feel her guidance and influence every day. Your passing, her passing instilled within me an acute awareness 
of the fragility of life and the gift of every day. I now live with a heightened sense of urgency to realize my divine potential and to do my utmost every day to harness all of my energy and talents to help other people realize their potential as well, which is what you just you just said, but it was just, it was articulated so well in that article. <laughs> So those those kinds of things, it's okay to hear them twice, <laughs> twice in, in different ways. I, one of the things that I try to remind people is that, um, and I think this was a moment these past few months, you know, I never believe that I'm trying to impose something from outside, but rather to help people uncover what's already in them. If you ask yes. any human being and you really help them turn off the outside noise, in a moment of confrontation with their mortality, there's no question that they'll start hearing their higher angels. The question is, how do they stay attuned to that higher frequency on a consistent basis? And you know, I think we can do that. And if we do that, our, our life will be so much more meaningful. Mm -hmm. I love when you say higher frequency because that's exactly what it is. You know, they're still here. It's just on a much much higher frequency. So I know you have six daughters. <laughs> bless your heart. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I mean, bless your wife's heart. <laughs> yeah, too. Sure. And I, I, I remember the story that you told about when a little reminder for you to because we have to remind ourselves right to to live this life of of divinity as much as we can or carry that within our heart and so you had the little experience at the airport with when you were um with your daughter so can you share that story because it was really touching for me sure you know it really uh to me was one of the most um eternal moments that i've experienced yes um and it was a reminder for me to be fully present in the moment that we're experiencing. So all of our daughters after high school, they spend a year studying in uh, Israel to get more in touch mm -hmm. with their faith and with Torah. So we were at JFK airport and about to send my second daughter, Michal, through security. And I asked myself, like, what do I wanna say when I'm not gonna see her for eight or nine months? And, you know, what do you tell your child? You tell them, okay, don't forget to write, don't forget to call. Somebody said to me, if you don't want to speak to them for a long time, just give them your credit card. Like, what do you do? <laughs> so then I'm so blessed out of the corner of my eye. And I'm grateful I wasn't looking at my phone. Literally, I saw a father putting his hands on the head of his daughter, giving her a blessing from the book of Numbers that God should watch over her and protect her. And literally, I felt like that's exactly what I needed to see and hear. And I turned to my daughter and I gave her that blessing. And I knew that was the right expression of my love in that moment. And then that was just one moment in time, which I don't, won't forget. And as I was leaving the airport, I said to myself, this feels really good. I want to be able to give my daughters a blessing, which many do on every Friday night. But the challenge for me was my father's custom is only to invoke that blessing before the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, which is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So I didn't want to divert from his custom. So I called my dad on the phone, explained the story. And he said to me with great is of humility, he said, if you have an opportunity to look your child or grandchild in the eyes on a Friday night and give them that blessing, that's what you should do. And then my father said to me, if I had to do it all over again, that's what I would have done as well. And then I decided from that one moment, literally, it was like 10 seconds it generated blessings where I began to give my daughter's blessings, oldest to youngest, my daughter's, my wife, excuse me, youngest to oldest. There's a traffic jam. And when they are not at home, now they're older, we call them on the phone, we FaceTime, wherever they are in the world. For years now, we'll give them blessings all because of that one moment in time. And then, you know, I've shared the story in many different ways people the the light from that one moment at jfk has exploded and then a few days after i actually had this happen to me um somebody emailed me and said it's not too late for your father to start giving you a blessing so my my dad i called him up and i said to him, look i'm in my 40s you're in your 70s would you mind starting to give me a blessing he said no he would love to and every friday morning he actually 
guy we married many years ago. He lives in Israel. I call him up. He gives me a virtual blessing. You know, he says, Donnie, I'm giving you a hug. And then I give the blessings to my children. And what moves me about that is, you know, had I just not paid attention in that moment, somebody would have said to me, well, how was your trip to the airport? It's like, how was life? It was great. But if we're open to seeing the miracles in front of our eyes, that one moment in time is now not only eternal, but it is multiplied in so many ways. Mm. And when we lead our life, realizing literally that we can bring heaven down to earth in any moment, if we're open to it, it's amazing how, uh, how really special our lives can be. Right. I, you're, you're so right. If we can just keep that in mind, that that glancing over, first of all, I will use the word angel, that, that really man that you saw was a little angel that for you anyway, and to see that, and then the ripple effect yes. it has had. And that's what so many near-death experiencers talk about when I interview them and they come back and they see, um, well, on the other side, you know, just how profound the ripple effect is. Just one little thing you can do just affects more and more and more people, you know, yeah, in, in good ways and sometimes not so good ways. So we all really need to remember that. So I know... Um, you talk about the importance and we we all know this but it's it's good to talk about especially when you have six daughters yes. of making each day extraordinary you say seize the moment once again the ripple effect so let's talk a little bit about the simple simple things that one can do or what you've done to to really try to be present and make each moment special and to teach your teach your kids that well, I think one of the first things when it comes to teaching anybody is modeling it ourselves. Absolutely. We can like talk here till tomorrow, but you know, it's like a mentor of mine said, and he tells this kid about honesty. And then one day, it's important to be honest. And then one day he got a phone call and they were in the middle of dinner or something and he didn't want to take the phone call. So he said to his wife, he said, tell them I'm not home. And then he like checked and said, what am I doing? Tell them I'm not <laughs> home. Just tell them I can't talk now. Um, And that also relates to how we um, express our gratitude every day. You know, nothing in life is always, you know, we only grow when we struggle. And there are obstacles and doors are closed. And, you know, when we lead our lives, and I try to, and I learned a lot of this from my parents, with a sense of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel says, radical amazement. Everything is wondrous. Everything is beautiful. My mom, a blessed memory, people would ask her how she was doing. She would say, thank God, fantastic. Even Uh, if it wasn't always great, but she was able to see the beauty um, in her life and in every day. And to me, when you wake up in the morning, I mean, this is a strategy. When you wake up in the morning, Zig Ziglar said this, you know, he was a great motivational speaker. He said, you can wake up in the morning and when the alarm clock goes off, you can have one of two reactions. You can go snooze 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 or you can go wow this is amazing i woke up i have 18 hours now to to live (laughs) you know and um the way you start your day is the lot determines what's going to happen that day as if in the morning we count our blessings you know my daughter does this and you know you just thank God that I can see, that I can walk, that I can talk, that I can open my eyes. All these things, it fills up your bank of gratitude, and then you feel just much more alive and inspired. And one of the things that's so important to say is, and we realize, and I believe it, that when we take our breath every morning, that's literally God saying, I love you. I care about you. I believe in you. And when we wake up knowing that what we do, what we does, what we do counts, and that we have a mission to inspiring, what I can accomplish today is going to be uniquely different than yesterday and different than tomorrow. And I think my daughters, and I hope they continue to be inspired by this, is you know we talk about these things, we try to model these things, um, we try to. Um, seize the moments every day to do what we call a mitzvah, a kind deed. There's a very important principle that means don't let an opportunity go to waste. 
if somebody asks you to do something or if you meet somebody, it was divinely designed and it's important to seize that moment because that moment may never happen again. So um, all those things, I think, keep us, as somebody once said, my job in life, a great mystic said, my job in life is not to resurrect the dead. My job in life is to resurrect the living. You know, a lot of people walk through life and they're just like gliding through, but they're not, they're not really energized. So those are some things that I reflect on a lot. Um, so I, um, something that we, my, we raised our children Jewish and I was raised Christian and I still, well, I'm more spiritual than anything else now. And Shabbat was always such, it, it was so profound for me because I thought this is like the coolest holiday could be as you have it every Friday. And it's amazing. <laughs> and it's amazing. And you make great food and yummy hala and you just let everything go and just love one another and we used to when the kids were really small we would grab them and dance with them and start singing um yeah. shabbat shalom yeah and so can you talk a little bit just about the importance of ritual and if you're not jewish that's fine you can still have a shabbat and call it whatever you want to but yeah. the importance of it and why you feel like that those sorts of things also you know help you really connect so i guess a couple of things you know one of the beauties of shabbat is it forces us to pause and reflect now i'll give you an example i mean yes. you know when somebody is involved in let's say an, you're an artist and literally for days on end you're in front of the canvas with your eyes in front of it and you're painting any artist will tell you that in order to gain a perspective on what you're painting you have to step back you have to put the brush down look at the painting reflect on it and see if it's really what going where you want it to go mm -hmm. and we're living in a world with information that is flowing nonstop with so many distractions, so much noise. And I would say that we need Shabbat more in 2020 than they did thousands of years ago. It's impossible, you know, years ago it was easy to turn the world off. You're in your home, there's no computer, it's dark outside, that's it. Maybe you have a little lantern to go on. But today it's possible to be plugged in to the outside world, but never really to be plugged into your inner world. So I recommend, even if somebody is not Jewish or whatever, is Again, part of it is a hiatus from social media, from your phone, from the computer. You know, give it a rest. Start with Friday nights when it gets dark. And don't open it again until Saturday morning. Just start with that. Start small. Right, right. You know, and then you'll be amazed. Oh, my gosh. No TV. I, I, well, I got to talk to the person next to me. I get to read a book. I, I get to go for a walk. You know, we don't go in cars. We're just like, it's refreshing and it's renewing. And I think Absolutely. also to move to ritual. Ritual is important too because it creates a structure around the day. You know, if I said to you, okay, just listen to your voice, what does that mean? But part of the structure is the meals together, the food. Like many times children will remember more a taste, a smell, what they feel, just being around the table. They're not going to remember what we say to them. But they will remember how we make them feel. And if they know every Friday night that mom and dad or grandpa and grandpa are going to give me their full, undivided attention, and we're going to thank God together, that's where the ritual comes in, the kiddish, you know? And we're going to say we're going to talk about how your week was and all that. Our children yearn for that. They yearn for our attention. You know, and I think that's something that is so lacking. And the structure and the ritual, I always say, I mean, it's one of the reasons I big proponent the bible or faith you know if, if my employer or if somebody a friend told me okay just turn off your phone at four o'clock even though i got a big deal going on i wouldn't do it i said no i gotta finish the big deal but when i know that it's coming from a higher power whom at the end of the day is responsible for all my blessings anyway right i'm only alive because of his grace and beneficence then i trust him that even when i turn off the phone before the market closes, or before the deal goes, you know what, God's gonna carry me. Just like he carried me six days a week, he's gonna carry me through the seventh day. And at the end of the day, we are more mission-driven and inspired on Saturday night to carry out, not God's will, but the will in us 
to really try to elevate the world around us. Beautifully said. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about Judaism and the many of the millennials, not only Judaism, organized religion, and just so many of our young are stepping back from, from organized religion and just becoming more spiritual. And I think that sometimes there's this idea that you can't really go talk to a rabbi because they're only Jewish, or you can't only talk to a minister because they're, but I've interviewed a lot. Of, <laughs> it seems like more rabbis than, but also some other um, chaplains and, and that's just not true. So I'd like for you to just to speak. I know I, I wrote you and said, what do the Jewish people believe about the afterlife? Because even though I raised my kids Jewish, I never heard that topic come up. So I, I'd like for you to speak to the listeners. Let's say that they just are not into, quote, religion, but just into spirituality and, and also um, about the afterlife and the beliefs of Judaism. Yeah. So, you know, I would say the first thing is, you know, I'd ask somebody a question like, what gives you the greatest, I know it's one of the questions you want to ask me, but I'll ask it back to myself right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I think what gives you the greatest joy? Yes. You know, everybody wants to find meaning and joy and impact. And when you really sit down with somebody, no matter how, whatever they are, politically, wherever they are, economically, they will tell you that what gives them the greatest joy is feeling that life has purpose, that they have relationships, that they are loved and they want to love, and that they feel a sense of, you know, that of, you know, a sense of, 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 of gratitude and appreciation. They, they count their blessings, you know. Those things make their life rich. Rich and happiness has nothing to do with how much money you have. It has to do with it's a byproduct of the life that you lead. If you're leading a life that is other-centered, that is giving with good relationships and you're kind and generous, that's what's eternal. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the people, if you actually ask them that, you know, and you talk about the you know, near death, if somebody is very sick, they're not gonna say, oh my gosh, I wish I traded more stocks and made more money. They're gonna say, you know what, I wish I spent more time with my family, with my friends. And I wasn't like running around with the chicken. So that's the baseline. And that to me is a spiritual question. So then I'll say to them, you know what? From my perspective, at least, Judaism and faith gives you a roadmap to ensure that your life is in sync with that goal that you have on a consistent basis. In other words, if you only turn to ritual or faith or, again, yeah, some people have for better or for worse, unfortunately, I think organized religion has a role, a significant role in bringing people together as community in creating a certain uh, cultural connection between people. But it's not about organized religion as much as it is, is helping people, no matter what their faith, with coming in touch with the divine within them, with giving them a sense of life, meaning, and purpose. And there are many rituals and many things to study forget the organized religion for a minute that can help people navigate that. And it's not going to be in the, the local newspapers or on CNN or Fox or social media or Facebook. A lot of the answers are within our faiths and can really help us, um, you know, lead greater lives. So I would say it's important to um, first help people discover, as I said, what's already in them. You start with the question of joy, mm -hmm. you know, forget, what you don't like about religion. Let's talk about you right now. What's important right. to you? And they'll say, do you want to feel that way a lot? Do you want to have more meaning? Yeah, I do. Well, let me give you some things to think about or things to do. And then, you know, it's a process. And then they'll learn more about this. Or what can I do to find people that are like-minded, that will help me, support me in that journey. And that's the way it right. grows. As opposed to putting it, you've got to go to church. You've got to go to synagogue. That doesn't help. It's got to come from within. And then really what we do as faith leaders, I think, is we try to um, give people fuel for the flame that's already in them. And then once they feel the warmth, and I say this to my kids too, like I would say sometimes when I'm trying to motivate my children to do something good, this is when they were smaller. I said, 
when they do the right thing, I said, how does it feel right now? I get them in touch with the spiritual. I'll say to them, your soul is smiling right now. They still kid me about that. Uh, but you feel good. And then like when they don't do something nice, not that it happened too often, say, your soul is crying right now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like they, no, nobody, you know, if you do something wrong, you know, let's say a kid hits somebody else for a moment, they feel, oh, I get to hit it. At the end of the day, inside, there's something after I say, you know what? I wish I didn't do that or I didn't say right. that. There's a certain, Absolutely. you know, but you feel good when you go help. And I'm trying to help them, you know, get more in touch with that side of them. So when I'm not there to guide them, they have the tools and the spiritual muscle to be able to move in that direction on their own. Right. And isn't it interesting how when we help them, it turns around and helps us even more, yeah. you know, to look at our own selves and, and remember when we were, you know, had that innocence. And yeah, one question, which I didn't answer, but I'll just touch on it for a minute is the notion of the afterlife, because, yes. you know, my feeling is, um, once somebody believes that there's something inside of them that is intangible, that there is a, you know, a, 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 whatever you want to call soul, a spark, the divine, then that soul is indestructible. That soul is eternal. Then the afterlife is simple because it just means just because your body does not exist anymore. The body is a vessel. The soul, you exist forever. And the afterlife is a state of being which you may not have a body. But your, your spark, the divine, who you are, is still, still real. And sometimes that soul we put back into a different body. I mean, some people believe that. Many in our faith do. Not everybody. That's reincarnation. That, you know, a person mm -hmm. may have other things that they need to do for perfection of their soul. And they come back to this world in a, with another role. Right. Thank you. I, I was... Really happy when I got that answer. From you. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was it was beautiful. So tell us about what mark I think we all know, but I'd love to hear you articulate the mark you want to leave on this world. Um, well, it relates a little bit, I guess, to what I said about my mom. I mean. You know, God doesn't ask any of us for perfection. That's impossible. But God does ask us to, again, realize the divine potential that he implanted within us to become our best selves every day to the best that we can. And then he asks us to create impact on the world. And, you know, there's a story that um, it's, in the, uh, it's in the Talmud that I think about a lot which says that before a human being is born, every human being, there's an angel that teaches them kind of the secret to finding the light of God in the world. And it says there the baby can see from one end of the universe to the other. It sees what God is all about. And then right before you're born, the angel places its finger underneath our nose. And that, right, that light is buried deep inside. It's not forgotten, but it's buried. And then at the very end of our lives, physically, we are greeted by an angel. And that angel we recognize because that's the angel that planted the light inside of us. And the angel is going to ask us two questions. Did you reveal the light that I planted within you? Did you try to become the best version of yourself every day? And then did you share that light with the world as best as you could every day? And that's my goal in life. To try to be grateful for every day, to be the best version of myself, and then to try to create as much impact as I can. Wow, that's it's it's so interesting. You just told that story because it was the first story. I think it's the Bab Babylonian. Is that how you yes, say that? Um, Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. Yes. Um, that is the first story I put in my blog and there's not very many stories in there wow. at all. Great. And it, it's just so sweet. And in the story, it says, she goes, Shh. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you don't, that, that you don't remember, but some of us, you know, some of us do remember more than others, children talking about things, but that's just, I think that's wow. so great. Go, go on my website and look under blog. It's the first one. It it's the very first story because it's so, it touch, it touches me. Um, 
it's just a great story. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Is there anything I didn't ask that you would you would like to share? This time went really fast. No, it's fine. I mean, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity. I think that yeah. um, you know we're also living in a moment now when there's an opportunity for us, you know, not to. Again, it's very hard. A lot of people feel a lot of emotional um, anxiety. They feel fear. Mm -hmm. They throw their hands up and wonder, what can I do? And it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, in this moment, um, God says there is something that you can do. And if we can, you know, change a corner of our universe and just try to light up somebody's life every day, that's the freedom that we have. We don't lament the darkness, but we increase the light. And everybody that's listening has an opportunity to increase the light. Could be at the supermarket, could be along the road, could be with a family friend. Just reaching out to somebody every day, um, not only will they be moved, but it will move us. And slowly that light will really uh, emanate around the world. So I'm always available uh, for anybody that wants to reach out on the website. But I uh, really appreciate it. God should bless you and all your holy work. Oh, thank you so much. And and just remind listeners what your website is one more time. Okay, sure. It's www.rabbidanielcohen.com. And if you go on the website, actually, they can download for free the first chapter of the book, which is about um, kind of identifying, helping you identify what is your best self. So feel free to download that and go from there. Great. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. We will see you soon. Uh, okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you.